Hello and welcome to the latest Blood Red podcast from the Liverpool Echo. I'm Joe Rimmer and I'm joined by Theo Squires and Tom Cavilla on this nice bank holiday Monday to discuss, well, it's going to be an interesting discussion. It was a crazy game at Anfield yesterday, Liverpool 4, Tottenham 3. Um, Liverpool 3 nil up, Tottenham got it back to 3-3. No sooner had they done that and Richarlison was pigeon dancing around Anfield that Jota was putting Liverpool back into the lead and giving them three crucial points. Champions League football might be... Over the hill and far away, but it looks like Liverpool are going to secure Europa League football if they continue playing how they're playing. Um, five wins on the bounce now, and much better. Theo, let's start with you. Um, oh, I don't even know where to start with this game. It was um, it was totally totally crazy, wasn't it? But I suppose let's start with try and sum up what it was like for those that weren't at Anfield yesterday. What that final sort of minute or so of football at Anfield was like. Uh, it was just surreal. Like Liverpool was superb for the first, what, 15, 20 minutes. And then they just let Spurs back into it. There were so many gaps and it was only a matter of time before Spurs got one, then Spurs got two, then Spurs got three. Uh, I think it's pretty obvious that as soon as Richarlison comes on, Richarlison's going to score. X everton he, he likes a goal against Liverpool. He likes a goal against, well, at Anfield. It was like written in the stars. And then you get that deflating feeling. But no sooner is that ball hit the net and he's doing his little pigeon dance, Jota's up the other end, pouncing on defensive error, puts it in in front of the cop, and then Anfield goes crazy. Like You hadn't even had a real moment to accept the fact that they've thrown away a 3-0 lead <laughs> and then they've pulled the leading again. I think in one way, it's the most predictable result you can see all season because Spurs notoriously start badly. Liverpool on form against these bigger teams start well. Salah always scores against Tottenham, it seems like. But then... Kane always scores against Liverpool. Son always scores against Liverpool. Richarlison, like I said, that was written in the stars that he was going to score against Liverpool. But beneath all of that, Spurs are always going to Spurs it. So I've been saying on these podcasts for a few weeks now, Liverpool will finish above Tottenham. Liverpool will beat Tottenham. They made hard work of it, but they got the job done. That They are a better team. And it just sums up the season for the both clubs. This is why they are not in the top four. This is why they're not really in the Champions League contention. They can't defend properly. They're very sloppy. They're inconsistent. When they're on form, they score great goals, but they just haven't been able to do it enough on a consistent basis. And that's why the, the gap's so high at the moment. It means we've got this Premier League classic seven goal thriller that shouldn't have been a seven goal thriller. Liverpool shouldn't have let Spurs anywhere near back into that game when you look at how Newcastle dismantled them so emphatically last weekend. But you take what you get. Another victory in the bag and Liverpool winning run continues and it looks like fifth of his place is in their hands now. Europa League uh, it's very much in their own hands. It's in their control. Tom Cavilla, Buenos Dias, um, sitting in the Liverpool office there. I mean, you were with me yesterday as we were sort of analysing the game and, and, and getting all the stuff in from the guys. It was, um, it's one of those ones that when you're trying to cover it, it's, uh, it's pretty stressful. I'm sure it was stressful for Theo and the other guys at the ground. But I mean, is that, I mean, Theo's just sort of alluded to it. Is that just Liverpool season in one game? Have we seen the strengths and the weaknesses of this Liverpool team um, just over the course of 90 minutes? Um, maybe, yeah, a little bit, I think. Um, I think this, we've seen it a few times, obviously. I think they did a similar to Brighton at home, was it, when they threw away, I don't think necessarily with three goals up, but I think it was 2-2, two, two, or no, no, 3-3, three, three, I think it was with Brighton as well. Um and so we have seen Liverpool, you know, throw away leads from time to time. But the fact that they've come back against West Ham and then again uh, the weekend, I think it's a good sign for Liverpool that they, you know, they're getting back to what they used to be like. Because, you know, the year they won the league, there was kind of that feeling that if, even if they went behind in the game, you know, they were always going to win eventually. You just, you just felt like even if they went 1-0 down, two goals down, they would always win. So I think it's it's good that they're sort of getting back to that. But like you said about the season, it's just been inconsistencies throughout the season. And we saw it again against Spurs. I mean, Newcastle, when they go 3-0 up against them, went and scored another two in the first half and they got a sixth in the second half. Like Liverpool shouldn't, when you're going 3-0 up at home, there's, there's it's very strange to then find yourself in that position of 3-3, considering Spurs... The week before did the same thing and, and at 3-0 you're sort of expecting them to just fall apart and it's going to be 5-6 but to be fair to them, they, they came back against United didn't they they did yeah but I think at home 
United were away, so you can kind of like mm-hmm. forgive it a little bit more. I think at home it was just a bit strange. Liverpool got obviously such a strong record at Anfield, but the fact that they, they got the, the win in the end is the main thing. But yeah, I guess that is why Liverpool where they are this season, because they just haven't had that same same strength you've seen the last few years, really, just being able to, even when they haven't been playing well, to get the wins. Um, and that's what's cost them this season and injuries, obviously. <laughs> Definitely. Well, we'll not start there. We will start on the incidents in the game, Theo. Um, there's about 500 of them. So um, <laughs> let's start at the very end. Klopp, you know, obviously we know what he's like emotionally. Um, and, and I think you can't love him for that passion and then constantly criticise him. But over the top yesterday, I mean, running to the lines and screaming in his face seemed a little bit, Seemed a little bit much, didn't it? After um, after Jota's winning goal, yeah, it was unnecessary, wasn't it? Like you don't need to go and celebrate in the, the fourth official's face. I get that he's had issues during the game. Like the emotion in that one probably came from was it the Salah Ben Davis incident where Spurs yeah. get a free kick, the attack yeah. goes up the wing, they get another free kick, and that leads to the equaliser. But it's not the fourth official who's <laughs> given the free kick or put the flag up. He's just the innocent bystander on the sidelines. He's the messenger boy. But we know at the same time, Liverpool and Klopp have this uh, checkered history, shall we say, with Paul Tierney and his officiating team. So that's come into it as well. But Klopp, he does cross the line sometimes with his celebrations, whether it's leaping on the pitch and jumping into Alisson's arms, or we've seen him screaming in the face of, um, was it the fourth official in the Man City game this season, which got him a, a one-game ban. You'd imagine he's going to get charged, he'll get a fine or another ban coming for this, because when it all adds together with his comments post-match, but like you said, this is why you love Jurgen Klopp because he's entertainment. Like he's so different to all the other managers. It's why people love Jose Mourinho before he seemed a bit everyone's against me. Like they make these stories happen. They're just uh, on the edge. It's uh, always dramatic. Uh, you don't know what's going to come next. But yeah, it, it was the wrong person for him to target. Really, like we've seen him a similar game to this one. For example, was the Norwich five four a few years ago. What was his celebration then? He runs to the players, he breaks his glasses. Was it Colo Torre or Christian Benteke? Yeah. Yeah. Elbows him in the face and breaks the glasses. He's celebrating with his players there. That's a natural instinct of reaction. That's what you want to see. Go and celebrate with the players that have pulled off this sort that, of comeback. There's that it's famous scary. one for Dortmund, isn't it? You know, the, the yeah, when he's crying back of the hill. Always screaming in the face. Yeah. Um, like the incredible. Oh, that, that one. That was the Champions yeah. League one, wasn't it? Yeah, when he, he got a one, touch yeah. line for that one. Yeah. But then there's the famous celebration. I think it might have been Dortmund or Mines when he runs and celebrates with the players as well. He's a very emotional manager. He's got this reaction to him. But you think he needs to be a bit more sensible there. And the fact that he's carried on into the post match comments, like, he, he will get in trouble for what he said, no doubt about that. He hasn't been very diplomatic, shall we say. He hasn't cooled down at all. But this is why we all love Jurgen Klopp, because he is this just entertainment 100% all of the time. Yeah, if you, you know, I, first of all, there's a few things I, I, I think to unpack on it. First first of all, the, the worst job in, in football is that fourth official job, isn't it? Well, I mean, why they get so much abuse? I, I can never understand. <laughs> they always get treated like they've given every decision on the pitch and my clock felt the need to run in his face. If he was going to scream in anyone's face, he'd have thought it had been the lines or the referee. But no, he, he chose the, the fourth official who um, I wouldn't say is mad in his own business, but certainly didn't have an influence in those decisions. So that's the first thing I think. But but I do think, you know, look, I think Klopp needs to be punished for this because you, the, there's been lines crossed this season with, with, with officials and, and look, they haven't helped themselves. I really found it hard to believe that, that the linesman wasn't, punished for what was clearly an elbow on Andy Robertson, and all, although Andy Robertson was probably across the line with his reaction. I don't think you can punish Mitrovic, for example, and, and not and not the linesman, and then, you know, Bruno Fernandes before that. So I think it's been a, a troubling season in that regard. And I, I would like to see Klopp punished because I think they need to get hold of it. And I think, you know, we've seen at grassroots level, certainly on Merseyside, um, there's some, been some real issues um, with, with the referee, and I think some of the managers, the way they behave, probably doesn't doesn't help things. So I, I would like to see them see them punished, um, just purely because I think that's fair, um, and I think Klopp would probably accept that as well. Um, but yeah, I mean the, the flip side of it is, why do we love Klopp? Because because he's passionate, and you've got you, know, you think of every big manager, Alex Ferguson, Arsene Wenger, Jose Mourinho, Pep Guardiola, 
they're all managers that live on the edge, aren't they? And they, they, they all cross the line sometimes, but they're winners. Tom, what, where do you stand on it? Do you um, do you think Klopp over the line yesterday? Um, probably, yeah, probably a little bit. I think a little like bit. Was... <laughs> yeah, I like you were saying. I, I do agree the fact that it was probably the wrong person. Like, if he was going to do it, surely you'd, you'd go up to Tierney. I mean, although that would involve sprinting onto the pitch. Um, that would I don't be think quite... we should really encourage Klopp to go and <laughs> No, and scream no, no. Sure. But I'm saying if he was going to, that would have made more sense. Um, yeah. Considering he clearly does not like Paul Tierney. But, um, yeah, I mean, I expect he'll get punished, like you said. It's probably the right thing. Um, because otherwise, like you said, it's just going to encourage other people to do it. And, yeah, I, I think he'll probably will get punished. And I don't think he'll have many complaints about it. But... I think because of everything that had happened in the game, you could understand why he was frustrated. But yeah. like you said, it, it just probably wasn't the right person to uh, to sort of go over to in that moment. Yeah, could be out yeah. for the season now, couldn't he? Hamstring injury, three game <laughs> ban yeah. coming. Yeah, well, he's already had one ban this season, so I don't know whether it works the same. But yeah, do they? I wonder whether they'll throw the book at him. Um, another, another one. Let's move on to. Um, let's start with Olive Skip on. Um, on uh, um, Luis Diaz because that one that came earlier and, and it sort of you might make the argument he, he shouldn't have been on the pitch and um, where'd you both understand on that stand with you Theo um, red card yellow card no card no free kick as um, <laughs> as is what ends up happening um, Tom we'll come to you in a minute but I know you spoke with um, representatives that, that, that sort of um, that, that represent VAR and they, they said it was checked and it clearly won the ball um, but but Theo, where did you stand on it? It seemed um, seemed quite a hard tackle, but no free kick to even go Liverpool's way. It seemed a very strange one. Yeah, it's definitely a free kick, isn't it? Like, even if he, he wins the ball, uh, like it always looks worse than the still images or when it's slowed down. But it studs up on his ankle. That that could be a seriously bad injury. We're, we're lucky that Luis Diaz is able to get up and continue there, and he was obviously in considerable pain when he's. Um, rolling around on the floor. Like I've said, I've only seen the steals and like that initial replay. So I might not have seen it as many times as you guys have. But in the, the feeling in the press box, I think me, Gorsty and Doyley was probably should have been a red card. But then that's like when you slow it down, you could always say the exact same uh, argument for the one that we're going to get to in a minute with Jota. It's like you see that still image or when it's slowed down of the boot going in the face. And that always makes it look so much worse that it is a red card. When you think, you got to be equal to both sides. You got to treat these incidents fairly. When the player gets the ball, fair enough. But when they follow through, that means it's a little bit wild. It's still a dangerous tackle. There's that contact there where he could cause a serious injury. He's out of control. At the very least, you expect to see a yellow card. So it's just laughable that Liverpool don't even get a free kick for it. And I think it's only one where you got Ryan Mason going. Oh, Jota should have been sent off. Jota shouldn't have been on the pitch to score that winner that's when you bang the drum a bit more going, well, if you're saying Jota shouldn't have been on to score the winner, uh, Skip shouldn't have been on to be on the receiving end of that tackle in the first place. That's only when you know you uh, colours the flag that bit more. Yeah, I mean, Mason did seem a bit of a whinge bag, didn't he, Tom, afterwards? I mean, he, he made a massive deal of that. But then also, you know, their equaliser really comes from Liverpool not getting the free kick down the right-hand side with Salah. Um, I mean, considering his Tottenham side was so, so poor in the first 20 minutes, for him to sort of to him sort of make out like it was all about decisions and not about the football was was slightly well it was off wasn't it and, it, and he was emotional but in 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 Klopp getting so much stick for his behaviour and rightly so Mason seems to have got away with quite a, an over the top reaction to the match himself doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think he, I guess he's probably feeling the pressure a little bit um, yeah. just because the situation Spurs are in. I mean, he he won't have liked what happened last weekend at Newcastle and so. You know, having watched Spurs go three goals down again, he's probably fuming watching that. So to then get to three three and then lose, that's that's probably where that reaction's come from. He probably can't believe his team have got to that position and then throwing it away again. Um I think Spurs they did look quite dangerous going forward, to be honest. They they did create well, they quite a few do. chances. They had they hit the post a couple of times, but I don't think he could a draw would a draw been fair, maybe just for the fact that they managed to come back from three goals down. I think if you ever no, managed... when you three nil up, it's not fair. <laughs> that would but have been you, a very bitter pill to swallow. If you've come back from three nil down, I think you deserve to get a draw. But 
I don't think you could say they deserve to win. They didn't deserve to win the game. But I think the fact that they managed to come back at Anfield, you couldn't say, you know, you didn't deserve that because any team that does that probably deserves it. Um, just on the red cards as well, I think probably, I think they were probably both red cards, to be honest. I think Jota's one is out of control. It's a high foot endangering the opponent. But same for skips really i mean although he gets the ball when you look back at it on the second replay he does make contact with the ball first but the follow-through obviously catches him still and it's still out of control so i think both players could easily have been sent off to be honest so i don't think again when mason's moaning about that i don't think he can have too many complaints because you could say skip could have had a red card as well so i think they're both fairly lucky to be on the pitch yeah, I think they were both yellow cards. To be honest, I, I think, I think in the in the the modern freeze frame game, I think it's quite easy to make everything look pretty bad. But Skips was, I thought Skips was a yellow card because although he does get a bit of the ball, you know, the, the you could talk about excessive force, couldn't you? He catches Diaz pretty badly, studs showing. Um, so, all that being said, I think a yellow would have been fair. The fact that Liverpool didn't even get a free kick for it seemed utterly bizarre. Um, and then the um, the Jota one, I, I get that people say it's an endangered opponent, but it's one of those ones that I think is it's not that high a foot, it's not as if he's, he's sort of drop kicked him in the face, he's he stuck his foot up to win a ball, and their lad is ducked. And you know, these things ha happen sometimes. And I think not everything in football when someone gets hurt has to be punished with a, with a red card. I think yellow cards for both were, were pretty fair, and I know I know he was cut and bleeding, but. You know, you can clash heads and be cut and bleeding. And you can you can be out of control in other ways. I, I don't think, I, I think with people now that you, they always want a response to things. They, they freeze frame things. You you look at what happens afterwards, the blood, the, you know, and you say, oh, that, that, that must mean that it's red cards. But, you know, I think that's both of them are part of the, part of the game. And, and um, you know, the physicality of it sometimes happens. So, personally, I, I thought it was a yellow card each. Theo, you've not had your say, say on Jota. What, what did you think on Jota, the, the fault? That was basically the same argument we had in the, the mix zone afterwards. Like Our consensus was he's actually got that right, booking Jota. Mm. Like, he's gone for the ball. He's not a deliberate attempt to injure any player. He's, he's not the tallest player anyway, is he, Jota? Neither Skip. It's not as though he's got it up shoulder height. It's because the player's ducked he's down. Jumped or anything, has he? He's, yeah. He's, not out it's of control. Not quite not. like the Mane one a few years yeah. ago at Man City. It was a lower foot there, and you can understand it. At the same time, if you're a Tottenham fan, of course you're appealing for a red card. You've come back from 3 0 down, you, you're wanting those extra advantages in a game. It's another one of those instances where if it's in your favour, you agree with the decision. If it's against you, you don't agree with the decision. But, yeah, Jot is not mate. There's no intent there, is it? He's not gone in as a dirty player. I, I know Spurs, obviously, they think it should have been a red card. You can see their, their coaching staff, the backroom staff, were very unimpressed at the time. They're unimpressed after the game. Skip himself I'm, I was heavily bandaged walking through the mix zone. And I'm, I'm assuming he was shown something on a phone uh, link into this. But yeah, it, it sounds of frustration and the size and the touch. So, I mean, he was very unimpressed by what he was shown on a, a phone in the mix zone. So he, he thinks he was hard done by and it should have been a red card but if we want to play this um skip's gone off injured richardson comes on richardson gets the equalizer richardson's not on to score that goal if uh, jotter hasn't kicked skip in the head so spurs what they complain about the only reason they got it through was because jotter injured their player in the first place <laughs> that's a that's a good way of looking at it um just quick one on richardson before we move on to some of the, the player performances um theo come on let's be honest how sweet was that you know he, he, he let's face it Liverpool fans booed him. They like a wind up. He's a bit of a wind up merchant, isn't he, Richarlison? But and I'm sure you know he has had good moments for Everton against Liverpool. But I'm sure he might have moments again. But he, um, that was sweet, wasn't it? To um, for it to be him to score his first Premier League goal and all that. Very much so. I, I, in, I said on Friday's pod, Richarlison is scoring in this game. He is getting his first Premier League goal in this game. And when he was coming on, I, I sent it to a few people, including our, our former colleague Adam Jones. He said, if Richarlison equalises, I'll pay for Echo Footy for you for the next three weeks. So then there's still that deflating feeling when it does. It's like, oh, he saved me a few quid, but I'd much rather Liverpool hold on for the win. So for Liverpool to then go up the other end and get that winner, wipe the smile off his face, that's what we all want. It's happy days all round. I, I personally like that Jota's initial celebration was the 
the calm, you know, that the hand going yeah. like that mm-hmm. to calm the crowd down. When Richardson's gone so over the top, doing the little pigeon dance, shirt off, celebrating wildly. Like it's the moment he'll have been dreaming of. He'll have been longing to get that goal yeah. against Liverpool to shut the fans up to end his drought. Like he loves being that player that Liverpool fans love to hate. The same way Suarez loved it the other way around. Like he's just that player that creates that little bit of needle. Yeah. I think it was yeah. Carragher's gone on Instagram, hasn't he, after the game, and he's uh, enjoyed it as well. It's one where Tottenham fans, he, he is the player you want to get that equaliser to get that big goal. Yeah. Everton fans all have wanted him to get that goal. Just uh, very pleasing to see Liverpool wipe that smile off his face very, very quickly. Yeah, Tom, some of the performances then. Let's start with um, the score of the opening goal. Curtis Jones now, he's been, been in the team for um, for several games, been playing well, Tom. What, what have you made of him recently? Uh, I think he's done all right recently, yeah. I think... Um, right. <laughs> no, I think, to, to his credit, I think he's played well since he's come in, you know, been starting each week. Um, let's just see. You know, we've got to see if it's a long-term thing, though. That's the thing with Jones. Um, you know, it's good that he's performing now at the moment, but it needs to be a long-term consistency for him. Um, I'm interested to see in terms of sort of next season what, what Klopp will do that, really, in terms of who's going to actually play in the midfield and who's going to be starting because, you know, we're expecting Liverpool to sign at least two midfielders. So I just don't know how how that's going to work next year in terms of people like Elliot and Jones in terms of their minutes in the team next season. Obviously, they've, they've had quite a few opportunities this year, Elliot in particular, with other players being out. Yeah, um, I know people like Cater and Oxford Chamberlain are likely to leave, but I just don't see... Jones, you know, starting games as he is now next season in the same position. You don't think, sorry, you don't think he'd be a quite a handy part of the squad, cone grown rule, all that sort of thing. No, next season. I think he'll still be in the squad, like he'll still be a squad player, but I'm just saying I don't think he'll be what he is now in terms of like a regular starter starting each Premier League game. He hasn't been this year, as he's he's started five in a row now, but but I mean he hasn't been a regular starter this year. So you don't think he'd play a similar role. Well, what I was saying, what I was saying is he's been starting the last five games from the start for Liverpool. If he's fit and everyone else is fit next season, I don't think he's he's not going to be playing, is he, from the start? But he's going to be a useful option to have. Is he a useful option to have? Is what I'm getting at. Yeah, and I think he has improved like in the last few games. Obviously, he's got a goal yesterday. You know, that's something he, I was lacking a little bit. Goals from midfield. Um, mm. You know, he's been taking people on a bit more, which has been good to see. So. Yeah, I mean, it's good to see and, and hopefully he keeps it up. I actually like the defensive cool. side of him. Like the fact that he is the one who's got the legs, he is the one who's leading the press and winning the ball back. That is something that's been lacking from Liverpool's midfield desperately for the majority of the season where Henderson or Fabinho have been that second too late to win a ball. A team gets through their midfield and they score too easily. Thiago as well. Jones has got that added bit of energy. And he, he's getting physical now. He's building it up, isn't he? He's not this skinny little teenager anymore. He, he's becoming a man and you're seeing it on the pitch. Like he's not been tired by Liverpool's midfield woes this year because he's not been involved in it. Now he's playing with confidence. Uh, he, he will start games for Liverpool next season. At the very least, he is starting all Europa League group games if they're in the Europa League. And then it's, well, who do Liverpool bring in? We know they want two or three midfielders. But you can make an argument for next season when players go... He could be pushing ahead of Henderson in the pecking order. They sign a number six and Fabinho drops down to the bench and it's this transition. He is very much part of that Liverpool future. And then it's just, he's got to compete with whoever comes in, whether it's a, a Mason Mount, Emmanuel Ugarte, whoever, we know they've been like 20, 30 midfielders at this point. So it's all very up, much up in the air. But Gorsty, I think, spoken to Curtis Jones recently. Harvey Elliott said the same yesterday as well. They're relishing the challenge of these new midfielders coming in, so then they can like see how it compares against them. Like they've been able to learn from the likes of Thiago in recent years, and now they've got this new challenge. Klopp said last year, "These boys are Liverpool's future," and it's about up to them to make sure that the future starts now. Now, I'm not saying they are going to be first choice for Liverpool for the very first game of next season. I think the fact that Liverpool threw away a three-goal lead yesterday shows that they're not there in terms of that yet, but they made, both made big strides this season. Elliot over the entirety of the season and Jones just in the last month or so, like people had written him off. People said they needed a whole midfield revamp. He had to go. He's not part of this future. But if he can stay free of injury, he's shown his talents and 
He's taken another giant stride. It's what you want to see, these local boys in the team. Like Klopp's always said, he wants the local boys in the team rather than the £100 million signings. And it's better for the club to have them. The fact that he's going to have this chance to prove his abilities between now and the end of the season, keep doing it, stay clear of injury, keep delivering, do it in pre-season. No reason why the shirt can't be his. I think that's um, that's exactly it. I mean, I was going to ask them, but why do you think he started the last few games, haven't really come out of the cold? But I think <clears throat> his legs, his physicality, um, he's playing. You know, I think what what sort of goes under the radar a bit with Jones is tactically, obviously, fills a bit of a role for Liverpool and does press, does give them a bit of stability working backwards. Um, and I think people miss the point a little bit and. and I would say that next season you don't you don't need him to be a starter. You don't need all these players, Harvey Elliott. They don't need to be starters. You can't have, you know, six, seven midfield starters. You can have three in the system Liverpool play, and um, and it's fine to have people like Jones coming off the bench or or playing in Europa League games, playing in League Cup games, playing in several league games. I think the problem this season is they've had so many injuries that they have not always had the options, or when they have, they haven't been consistent. So. I'm really pleased to see Jones come in. I thought he took his goal really well. And, and um, I think he's been a big part of this Liverpool return to form in recent weeks. And, and all right, yeah, I don't I don't think he was the absolute finished product in Liverpool's midfield. But then I don't really necessarily think he has to be. So fair play to him. Um, another performance. Is, sorry to interrupt there. Is, he knows Klopp's demands. He knows what he wants in this midfield. He's been in the club, the system for so long. Like you only need to look at Darwin Nunes now, how he's lost his place because he's that newer player and it's taken time to adapt. We don't know exactly who Liverpool will bring in. We don't know if whoever they do bring in is going to be this instant success, goes straight into the starting eleven, just gets it completely, or if they need a bit more time. Like they're in and out the side, it takes a while to get up to the tactics, the demands. If that's the case, like with some so many players over the years, and that's going back to the likes of Fabinho and Andy Robertson then it's another bonus to have, just have these midfielders in there who are part of this future, who can carry that weight, carry that load until they are ready. But it's always been this shared process. Granted, it will be a bit different if Liverpool are in a position where they don't need 10 midfielders because of the injuries. They can have six or seven midfielders that just stay free of injury and they don't need that weight in the squad. And that's when the manager's got real tough decisions to make. But then Klopp wants to be in a position where he has got those tough decisions to make. And we saw that last year when he had, what, six, seven strikers to choose between. That's yeah. the position Liverpool want to be in. Yeah, just a quick word on Nunes. You mentioned him there. I was going to ask about him. I mentioned in the last pod that I had a slight worry um, about Nunes. I just find it slightly odd that he's completely dropped out of the team. Um, you know, he, he hasn't had a terrible season, but suddenly the, the, the communication issues seem to be seem to be being being mentioned more often by, by Klopp and others. He seems to be a bit more erratic on the pitch. Certainly, yes, I don't think he really made a great impression when he came on. Um, we saw Thiago seemingly translating for him on the touchline. Tom, I mean, do you share any concern about Darwin Nunes? I've got this sneaky feeling, and it's based on nothing. I'm not saying that, you know, I definitely think it will happen, but I've got this sneaky, strange feeling that, that I don't know, that, that the clock could almost consider consider offers for him. I don't think so. I, I think if he's got 15 goals this season, like in his first year, I think that's a fairly like respectable return. Like coming to Premier League, obviously different demands to um, Portuguese league, different style of play. I don't think you know. Obviously, the, there was a lot made about the fee involved to bring him to Liverpool, but I think if you take that goal return for his first year in Liverpool, I think it's I think it's okay. I don't think it's amazing, but I don't think you can say he's been a flop. I know a lot of fans. No, I'm not saying that. But don't, no, no, don't I'm saying mean, a lot of rivals have called him a yeah, flop and said yeah. he's, you know, he's not been anywhere near the worth the money. But I think it takes time with these sort of players, and I think next year, I think you'd have to judge him on next season. If he didn't do it again next season and didn't look adjusted to the system next season, then you could start to say, okay, maybe it's not worked out. But I think to sort of say after one one season that it's not worked out could be, you know, let's just cut a losses. I think, I don't know, I don't think Liverpool would do that having spent that time sort of investing in the player. And mm -hmm. I think they're always really sure on someone when they sign them. So be surprised if they were, were to go, yeah, let's just, just get rid of him. I know Klopp did that with Ben Teke, like 
start of his career at Liverpool when he sort of judged him not to be the right fit, but that was someone who was there before he had arrived. So I don't know. I, I just didn't, I don't see it him being sold in the summer. I think he'll I stay. Think, yeah. He left Dortmund, didn't he, before? Sorry, he's up He left Dortmund before he would have been sold, but Immobile was a player that Klopp signed, didn't he, for a lot of money. Didn't quite work out at Dortmund. He, he didn't seem... To, I might be wrong, so please do correct me if I am, but he didn't seem to play as much during Klopp's final season as perhaps you, you, you would, have, would have thought. I don't, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not... Look, I'm not sitting here in any way calling Darwin Nunes a flop. I think he's been far better than than many people realise. Um, I think he's got a hell of a lot of potential. But just something strikes me as odd in recent games. And as Liverpool have got back to form, what I find slightly interesting about it is Darwin Nunes seems to be playing less and less of a role. Do you know? Uh, uh, there is a point to it. Like The reason he's playing less is because Diaz and Jota are back. Because yeah. Jota is up to full fitness. He speaks the language. And like I've just made the point with Jones, he gets the system. He gets the demands. If you want to get back to form, you need to go back to Bay 6. It's just an easier way to do it. Klopp said himself that it's hard for the team with all these injuries. But then when you throw a new striker in it as well, if Diaz and Jota hadn't been injured for as much as they had this season, Firmino as well, Nunes probably doesn't play as much as he does. He gets a bit more time on the training field. He gets to adjust behind the scenes. But... There's that price tag he's thrown in. The pressure's on him straight away. In the past, I, I, I get those concerns. The first, well, Liverpool just give up on him. It hasn't necessarily worked. Like we've seen that with what Craig Bellamy, Andy Carroll. Like, it, it, when we went through a phase of Rafa Benitez signing a striker one summer and then selling them the next, and he did yeah. that with so many players. It wasn't just strikers; it was like left backs as well. But that doesn't seem to be the Liverpool way anymore. Like Klopp has been at the club for such a long period of time. They've got the clear uh, recruitment style. They probably expected Nunes to be able to speak a bit better English by now, but they still had the belief that he could fit into the system and be what they want. And it just there's more light on it because Cody Gakpo's come in, he just gets it. Yeah. Cody Gakpo yeah. speaks perfect English. And when you've got players who are already used to the system, he needs time. Uh, as it stands, you would say next season, he's not your first choice for Liverpool because Gakpo has gone in and made that number nine position his own because Diaz and Jota offer that bit more on the wing, both offensively and defensively. Like Nunes, if he's on the flank, he's still a striker on the flank. And up front, he's just not a Firmino Gakpo. It's like Liverpool had this idea of what they wanted to do. They wanted to change things slightly. They wanted a number nine that would get them goals. Then they realised, hang on, why don't we just do what works for us? We'll go with the false nine. We'll get our goals from Salah and the other wide man. They need to find that role for him. But then it isn't a position of, this is your role. You were just a striker or you were just a winger. They like that versatility. And he's still so young. Klopp has said he is a long-term project. And I think you've got to have that faith in him being a long-term project. Like We only need to look at Naby Keita. Liverpool's stuck by him for, what, six years now. Yes, they're going to lose him on the free transfer in the summer. That hasn't worked out. But Nunes has done more in a season than we've seen from Keita, really. like Yeah, he contributed quite a bit to the quadruple charge last year, but the injuries there... You'd like to think that they're not going to give up on Nunes just yet. And the best is still to come. There is more to come from him. If we're still having this conversation in a year's time, he doesn't speak English very well. He's not getting it defensively. He's not getting his instructions. We don't really know what his role is. Gakpo's doing a better job. Diaz and Jota are doing a better job. Maybe then you have concerns. But look, we're in this position where if Nunes does really well for them, he is a club record signing. If he doesn't, 65 million, still a lot but they'd be able to get a considerable amount of money back for him. I don't think we're in that position yet. You're not anywhere near having that conversation yet. And he's still a Liverpool fan favourite for a reason. They don't need to hear the, the cop when he comes on chanting his name, just the sight of him warming up. He makes things happen. And maybe we're noticing this game time dwindling recently because in those cameos, he's not making things happen. Whereas earlier in the season, he would have been. Yeah, I mean, just a quick word as well on Gakpo, Tom. Um, they were mentioned him a couple of times there. Um does it speak volumes about how good Gakpo's been that he, since he's come in, really? Yeah, the first sort of month or so was quite difficult for him, but since then he's really settled down. And, and, and you know, I think he was involved in everything good about Liverpool's first three goals yesterday, had a hand in all of them. Um, seems to have really just grabbed this central central striker role for Liverpool, doesn't he? Yeah, they said it was a tough start for him. I think it was six games, first six games without scoring. And at that time, people were saying, you know, is it was it the right signing? 
did we get the wrong player or I don't know anyone that was saying that they were yeah. people yeah. were not were not so, happy with him at that time I'd so, never have said something like that myself but go on carry on some people were questioning whether it was the right fit whether it was the right signing for Liverpool because there was, in the first few games he did look a bit shaky um but I think since then you know he's obviously uh let his feet do the talking he's now scoring goals involved in linking up the play and yeah I think he's He's proven why Liverpool signed him, and and um, you know he's a player like you said that suits the system. So yeah, he's, he does, doesn't he? He suits it. So yeah, you would imagine he's going to be you know starting a lot of games next season for Liverpool, and hopefully would become an important player um, in the long term. But I'm just interested to see who who is the front three next season, or in terms of what formation we play, or what you know what what formation Klopp chooses next season in terms of. How he's going to fit all of those attackers he's got at his disposal uh, next season into the same lineup. I, I don't know who who will be first choice. Salah's obviously likely to be starting again every game, but in terms of the others, it's it's quite hard to sort of pick out who who would be the first choice pick at the moment because when everyone's playing well, they're all at a fairly similar level in terms of quality. So in terms of who misses out, it's a bit of a difficult one, really. That's not a bad thing, though. I mean, supposing no. managers won't have a clue who starts and players have to push each other on to get that start in place. We saw what the extra competition for places meant for the, the attack last year. You need that again next year. Um, and if they're all stepping in, starting games, scoring goals, you can't have any complaints. Yeah, definitely. I think it's it's a good thing. And he's got a luxury there. Perhaps not so in midfield. Um, just let's, let's talk about Trent. I thought yesterday again... Um, involved in the good things that Liverpool did, but there were there did seem to be spaces for Tottenham to, to get in behind Theo. Um, I was listening to the Gary Neville podcast today, and he, he was sort of quite critical of um, of playing Trent in that position. Seems to sort of be suggesting that Liverpool were papering over the cracks and that it wasn't a long term solution, and they've got to stop messing around. Um, he also criticised Kanate, who I think did struggle a little bit yesterday, but. Well, I, I would have thought that the, the general consensus around this Trent switch, especially in the last five, would be that he has played pretty well and that it's been a pretty good thing for Liverpool and it's been getting Liverpool better and you know, going going forwards and and um and made them more dangerous. But obviously not everyone thinks that's a case. What do you think? Do you think it's a long term solution? Do you think it's something Klopp's just trying just to get through these several games and, and get through to the end of the season? Um, what do you think of Trent's performances there, and is it is it is it a gamble or sort? That, that's just it's a balancing act, isn't it? Of how how much Liverpool are being left exposed at the back compared to how dangerous they are going forward. What do you think is more important at this moment? Um, I guess we'll see when the transfer window opens and we see who Liverpool sign, like what players they're prioritising in terms of midfield, and then Trent's role in that. Like if they have a Fabinho Mark II who's got the legs and you could have Trent back as right back. Everything's fine. The old system works again. But there is no doubt that it has suited him. It has suited Liverpool getting him in the field, getting him on the ball more. Like he is helping cover the ground for Fabinho and he is in the heart of everything going forward. Um, he's involved in what? Winning the penalty. He's a brilliant cross from from the first goal. He's just right in the heart of all the action at the moment. I mean, so many touches, so many great passes, so many great crosses. That's where he's dangerous. You want him in that attacking third where he can get on the ball and make things happen. The argument is, why are Liverpool wanting him in the hybrid role? Is it really the best for them? Like It does create gaps at the back. No wonder Canarse is having a few difficult games where he's got to cover right back, he's got to cover centre back. He's got the pace for it, but it's still a big ask for him. We saw a side wins ball in possession um, in midfield. And you've just got all that space in behind because your right back's not there. He's now in midfield. It can create problems, and it is there something that can be exposed. Um, it's probably part of the reason why Man City maybe haven't been as dominant dominant this year. Like I know they're finishing the season strongly, but there is always that confusion with this uh, formation. When it works, it's brilliant because you're on the ball. You've got that extra midfielder, and you can just control games and make it look so easy. But if you can get a way to take advantage of those spaces, get in behind it. It looks very vulnerable and it's probably a formation that has protected Trent in the sense that when there have been those spaces, when teams have gotten down the right-hand side or down the middle, 
you're not blaming Trent anymore because he's not there for them to be running past. It's, oh, Van Dijk slipped over and Perisic just got the cross in for the first goal when normally it'd be Perisic just got past Trent far too easily. Uh, it's other players who are taking that blame and they don't get the same scrutiny that Trent would in that role. The argument is there, well, if he's so good in the ball, should Liverpool just play him in midfield permanently? Do they want to do a two number sixes, do like a, a 4-2-3-1 and just reinvent him? I think Pop's very stubborn. He's very, very insistent and adamant that Trent is a right back, best right back in Europe. Um, throughout his Liverpool reign, he took issue with Southgate playing him as a midfielder. This is the compromise we're seeing. It's just whether Liverpool get back to their previous best or if they go and sign a great right back and you can put Trent in midfield. It's, it's up in the air. It depends what they see behind the scenes, what they want to do transfer-wise, who they can bring in and where they can get the best out of Trent. At the moment, short term, it is the right decision because it's getting the best out of the Trent and it's getting the best out of the team going forwards. They're still leaky defensively. They're still conceding goals, but rather than losing games 3-0, they're creating enough to win games 4-3. But it's still something that he's a long, hard look at in the summer when players come in, when they've got pre-season and all do, all do all this work on the training ground to get it right and work out what is the setup for us? What is the identity? Where is the intensity? What do we want to be? What do you want to see when you're watching Liverpool going, yes, that's Liverpool? Like For years, it has been uh, what the Salah and the Mane pace out wide, Liverpool just uh, bulldozing through teams, hitting them on the counter-attack, the high-pressing midfield, uh, Van Dijk being able to cover so much ground basically on his own, like him and Fabinho essentially being two players. But they're, they're getting older now. If you don't have the replacements for them, you've got to find alternative ways to play football. I think that's what they're doing now. OK, so one final performance I wanted to touch on, um, Tom, is um, is that Paul Tierney, who is um, is not Klopp's best friend. Um, uh, the, the two of them don't seem to get on well at all. Um, lots of things said today. I just want to touch on it quickly because I know we've touched on the incidents individually and, and whether they should have been red cards or yellow cards. Um, but there, there does seem to be, for certain teams, referees who just, I don't know, for whatever reason, they, they just don't seem to sort of gel. Um, whenever he referees a Liverpool game, whether there's more scrutiny on him or or whether, you know, even it's inside his head a little bit. But he certainly doesn't, there certainly seems to be a lot of conversation around him afterwards. What did you make of his performance yesterday? Do you think that some of the issues at the end were in part due to, perhaps him losing control of the game or not getting some of the bigger decisions right? Or do you think there's a little bit, that's a little bit unfair on him? I don't think it was the worst, um, you know, it wasn't the worst refereeing performance we've ever seen, but it wasn't great. I mean, there were certain certain decisions, obviously, that could have gone either way, like the ones we've touched on earlier. I don't think he, you know, like we said, it could have gone either way with those. People have different opinions on whether they were yellow or red. So I don't think he was necessarily, you know, you can't point the finger at him too much for that because I think other referees, it depends on who the referee is. Some have a different approach to the game. Some like to let it run a bit more. Yeah. Others like to, you know, whistle every couple of minutes and make it stop-start game. But I don't think you can, can't really get away from the fact there have been games he's been involved in with Liverpool that have been some really strange decisions. I think the one with... Uh, against Tottenham as well last season was probably that was probably one of the worst ones I can remember the the um, he, was, he was the guy who blew up as well didn't he remember when Mane was sort of yeah on at the end of the United game and he, and he blew up then but the the Tottenham away game the 2-2 two -two, it's just strange it was against Tottenham again um that game with that penalty against Jota which wasn't given like that that was a the clearest penalty you'll ever see and then the Harry Kane challenge as well that was another a tackle that was a red card so for both of those to go against you in one game I, I would i can understand why clock was was fuming after that one and i think ever since that game there's there's been a bit of a you know bad blood between them and i think T tierney probably doesn't help himself the way he sort of reacts to clock but i suppose in a referee in that position you can't you know they can't really get too involved in anything so I think Liverpool will be hoping they don't get many more games of Tierney, I would imagine, going forward, because I think if Klopp continues to, you know, sort of make a personal case against Tierney, you, it always feels like he's going to sort of play up to that a little bit and try and not aggravate Klopp. But that, That's what I mean. Like surely, yeah. surely that is in his head. That, that will wind Tierney up big time. Yeah. So you know, when he's doing a Liverpool game, you, you, you do wonder whether he's thinking, you know, I'm, I'm just going to, 
he's not going to purposely make a wrong decision, but he might do certain things that will rile Klopp up a bit because he may not like him, particularly the way he's treated him after games and that sort of thing. So I think Klopp sort of going for him after games is not going to, you know, it's not going to help that really because Tierney's more likely to just kind of go along with that in future games. Yeah, yeah this is set up to be much worse in the future. Like We, we spoke about like the Tottenham game before this one, didn't we? Like, oh, he was the referee in charge where Kane should have been sent off. But it was still just like, you know, your normal referee discussion. This now, next time Liverpool play, yeah. uh, Tierney's in charge. There's going to be so much focus on it. It's almost untenable for him to be in charge of a Liverpool game because there have been those accusations that every decision will be under such scrutiny. Mm. Any mistake is going to be jumped on. Everyone's going to be watching Jurgen Klopp's reactions to it. Uh, and he clear the air talks or something because you'd like to think no official is biased. Uh, it's just one of those things, human error or disagreements. Like a player or a manager can say something controversial, make a mistake, and they still have a fan base behind them that will support them. They've got an opposing fan base against them that will shout out against them. Who do the officials have? They don't have anyone who's going to be supporting them there. Like they'll be Team Klopp, Team Liverpool. Oh, he's done all these bad decisions against us in the past. He's got it in for us. I, there needs to be some sit down here, I think, between Klopp and Tierney, something to clear the air. They can't just let it go like they did last year. Like it has taken that extra step now where it's got personal. Like I know they've used the audio and said, oh, He's not acted unprofessionally at all. He's not said anything bad towards Klopp. But Klopp's clearly heard something and thought he has um, when he's been given that yellow card. So there needs to be some sort of communication here to ease it over, to smooth over things and just make the relationship a bit better. You're not asking him to be friends or anything and Klopp to be looking forward to refereeing Liverpool games again. But it needs to be in a position where next time Paul Tierney is in charge of a Liverpool game, it isn't the story. He is just the bystander, isn't he? He's just the referee. He's the one who's supposed to do as little as possible in an ideal world in the middle as we're watching a great game of football. You don't want it to be about the referee and all the incidents in the game. Yeah, I think that's spot on. I think they, I think for a start, they need to take Tierney off Liverpool games for, for a little bit for the future just because I think there'd be too much pressure on him. And yeah, I think there needs to be some sort of clear the air. You know, look, I, I, I'm always... I'll make no apologies for saying that. I don't believe there's the referees are biased against any teams. I don't think that, you know, I think the fans, I think referees get treated very unfairly. Um, and they get put under far too much pressure. I think Klopp's pretty out of order yesterday. And I think sometimes he's a bit out of order as well about, um, you know, I look back on the Kane and, and Jota instance. And yeah, whilst I agree with you, Tom, I think Kane should have been sent off that night. I think Jota should have been given a penalty, you know, at the end of the day, we can't really be still talking about those things a year and a half later. I think you know bad decisions can be made, and that that's football. So you know it's it's um it's one of them though. I just don't think they can let this situation continue to get out of control because clearly there was a bit of bad blood or sort of, certainly a misunderstanding on both sides. So I think um, Tierney should be taken off Liverpool games for the foreseeable future, and talk should be had. Um, let's move on finally to just picking our teams for the Fulham game, which. Liverpool do play again this midweek. Um, they are um, for the final stage of the season coming thick and fast. That's the cliche. Uh, Theo, obviously, no change of goalkeeper. But would you bring Matip back into that back four? Any other changes, Simicast, perhaps? Um, I think there's an argument for Simicast to come in. I, I was about to say same back four, same back five. But now, when you, you make that Simicast case, I don't think Robertson played well against Tottenham at all. He gave the ball away a lot. You know, yeah. a lot of players were guilty of that. But when you've got the options of quality there, so you can rotate, it seems a game where you can bring Simicass in, but the rest of it, you keep the same. Like As good as Matip was against uh, West Ham, I, I don't think he's part of Liverpool's long-term future. Canate is the one you want in that partnership with Van Dijk. He's the one who's got that extra pace. If you're sticking with this formation, he offers that protection. And then Trent as the, the inverted fullback. Don't really have any alternatives there. You don't want to see Joe Gomez popping up in midfield anytime soon, do you? So, yeah, Simicast can come in, but the rest of it's the same. Tom, agree with that? Um, I'd probably play Matip ahead of Canate. Yeah. Um, I think Canate didn't have a great game. Um, probably a bit lucky to get away with a penalty at the end as well. Had his hands yeah. all over Richarlison. So, yeah, I'd give him, a, give him a rest for this one and bring Matip in, see if he can get another goal. But keep the full-backs the same. Yeah, I think, um, I think I... 
I would probably keep Kanate M, um, bring in Simicast. I think certainly there needs to be some freshening up, and I never like changing changing defenders too much. So um either so, just pop. No, no. So I think it's um I think sometimes it just disrupts things, but Fulham played very well against Man City and Liverpool are gonna need to, to make sure that they're on point. Um in midfield, Tom, what would be, be your midfield midfield three? Well, I would like to see Thiago playing again, but it's just whether he's going to be fit or not to play. Um, probably unlikely. So I think you'd start Jones again after the goal, Fabinho. Um, probably Henderson as well, I'd bring back in yeah. this one. Yeah, so I think I'd go for those. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I think I'd go for the same trio. It, it does depend on if Curtis Jones is fit to play because he has played a, a lot of football recently. Yeah. But he, he seems to be the midfielder that's making this tick at the moment. And as I've said on other podcasts, um, you've got to get Liverpool's combination in midfield right because I don't think like I know I don't think Thiago is going to be fit because he was limping yesterday. Uh, I know we haven't had comment from Klopp yet. We'll be at that tomorrow. It'd be a surprise if he's fit. And if, even if he is fit, you don't put him straight back to the starting eleven after an injury. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think he suits this system either, to be honest. Uh, he doesn't have the legs for it. You need someone who can run around uh, alongside uh, Trent or Fabinho. And you need that bit more physicality to be the wide number 10s. That, that's what I'm calling them, by the way, the wide number 10s. It's a, a new role that Jurgen Klopp seemingly invented with Curtis Jones and Jordan mm-hmm. Henderson. And the only other option you can really do it's Milner. But when Henderson's had this game off and Jones is the, the man in form, they, they keep the places and Henderson comes back in. Yeah, I'd probably go along with that. So the same midfield three for me. Um, up front, Tom, um, does Darwin Nunes get a start? Does Jota come back in? Yeah, I'm really torn about the attack, actually. I, I, like I was saying before, it's really hard to like pick out a three at the moment in terms of who should be playing because Diaz had a decent game. Um so did Gakpo. So Salah is always that player that never seems to get dropped. Even if you know, I know he scored, but even if he's had a bad game, he never he never comes out the get um, the team for a game. Um, so I can't imagine he will be dropped. I thought for a minute you were about to drop him. <laughs> but, drop him? <laughs> not suggesting, team? not suggesting he should be, but I'm just saying that that is a bit strange. That uh, yeah, when he has had a big bad game, he doesn't come out the team. Um, I'd be tempted to give Nunez a go just because, as we've said before, he's not really been getting a look in. Let's think at Fulham, they, they'd they get the job done. I know the Fulham have been doing well this season, but they're on a bit of a tough run at the minute. I think they've lost seven mm-hmm. of the last nine, something like that. So maybe we give Gakpo a rest for this one, give Nunez in and Diaz or Jota. Uh, give, let's give Diaz another game, another start. Mm-hmm. Can you translate that for Darwin for us? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Theo, what, what, what's your front three? Um, Salah starts. Gakpo starts. Um, I'm going to bring Jota back in for Diaz. Don't think Diaz did anything wrong. I thought he played well. He was lively again. But he only he had got like an hour, didn't he? They've still got to tread carefully with him. This is his first start in six months. You don't want him to do two starts back to back in a space of a few days. Maybe bring him back in to start against Brentford. But yeah, Jota, another goal for him, he can start. Nunes will have to wait again. Obviously got a goal off the bench against uh, Fulham at the start of the season. So maybe he can have a, a similar impact here. But he just doesn't seem to fit this formation and the demands at the moment when they are trying to finish the season strong. Maybe when Europa League has wrapped up or Champions League's officially dead, you can give him a few starts to get a few goals and confidence. But at the moment when there's still something to play for, he can be a substitute. Yeah, I'd go for the same three, I think. I think Salah and Gakpo are pretty nailed on. Um, uh, you know, I think I don't really like anyone playing that forward position, the, the central forward position other than Gakpo right now. Uh, Salah's pretty much nailed on. And then on the left, Jotha just has been effective, hasn't he? So Jotha would be would be my third man. Um, quick predictions, Tom. Uh, dead quick. Liverpool, will they beat Fulham? Uh, let's go for 2-0. Two 2-0. Nil. Two nil. Yeah, to Liverpool? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> he's a Fulham fan on the sly, isn't he? Um three one Liverpool. Like clean sheets have been a concern recently, but I can't see it suddenly turning around. I think it's gonna be two one Liverpool. I think it's gonna be a slightly tougher one than, than perhaps people anticipate. Fulham Fulham watch I haven't watched Fulham yesterday. I thought they played really well and um 
created some real issues for Man City. So if they play anything like that, um, Liverpool will have their work cut out. And that's all for us. Um, yeah, an interesting one today. Hopefully, some, uh, Wednesday's game is a bit more routine. And then we'll be back on Friday to look ahead to look back at that Fulham game and look ahead to the weekend. So we'll see you then. Ta-ra.